we got a, a big crowd here itching to get started. So Let, let's get going. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you guys for all the patience. As I was saying, today's session is on portfolio management. And I think a very, very timely one, right, Dad? Yeah, well, that's kind of the whole, when, when things started dropping, I, um, oh, Carson says, can, oh, can hear you. Thank you, Carson. Yeah, when the markets took a turn recently, um, I, I know, and even with our with our student chat and everything, just online in general, it can be disconcerting for a lot of people. And it kind of just reminded me of the importance of having a properly developed portfolio. So I just thought, well, heck, let's just have a general talk. Uh, there's there's a few points I thought I would bring up, but at the same time, I really would want to hear from you guys and um, as much as possible, just answer your questions as far as you know, portfolio management is concerned. Um, so feel free, please, to to throw comments in there while we're going along. But Darwin, if you uh, please don't mind going to step one or slide one there, um, I will uh, just talk about a few a few key points and. The first point on there, I hope, is really obvious. Uh, emphasis, you know, investing during volatile times, it emphasizes the importance of having a properly designed portfolio. And it is really, really easy when the markets are going up. You know, even if you've laid out a plan, it's really easy to stray from that. And one of the biggest challenges that uh, an investor has, and when I was working with clients uh, for all those years, when the markets were hot, um, I would regularly talk with people or I would they, they would question me and say, why do we have this? Why do we have bonds? What about X, Y, Z? It's been going up a lot. And it's challenging to, to keep that perspective of always having a little bit of downside protection or a lot of downside protection in some cases. Um, and I, I'm not sure how you guys uh, have dealt with that. Uh, for a lot of you, it's the first time we've really gone through a major downturn well and i don't even call this really major this is a significant correction i don't even know where the markets are at this morning but i know they opened down again and it can feel like uh, it can feel like am i doing the right thing and so um the uh the second point of the slide here is it emphasizes the importance of having a plan and hopefully um, for those of you who have taken you know, even the, the beginner training or the basic training, a large part of what Brandon talks in that in those modules is is identifying who you are as an investor, what type of, of investments you want to own, how your portfolio should be construct, constructed. And then um, it really emphasizes that here to have that that plan. And the third point here, uh, the key is being proactive and the tendency right now if you weren't properly positioned going into this recent downturn here is well what do i do now and yes there are some things you can do now but this is really typically you're going to hear this is not the time to be making any major adjustments to your portfolio on the downside because you know it's not a good time to be reducing volatility let me put it that way for most people no blanket statements of course everybody's a little bit different I'll but, just um, being proactive, making sure that that these are the types of things that you can expect that go on. I think in a couple of slides down, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. For me, having gone through this for so long, uh, for so many times, these are just almost second nature. My concern is for people who are going through it for the first time. Or, heck, I worked with clients for years and years and years who would be fine until we hit this. And then it's just this... this um, Mm -hmm. You know, we're humans and you have these emotions that crop up and, and all of a sudden you're feeling that anxiety again. So um, I wonder how you guys are doing. Um, you know, Brandon and, and you've been on the Discord every day. And, and for the most part, I'm hearing uh, yeah. a positive thing saying I'm looking at this as an opportunity to add two positions. But um, is you that know, sort of the general consensus out there? I think that is. And yeah, again, feel free to chime in with in the chat here, guys, with how you guys have been handling this, if it's more exciting, if it's more scary. I think if you have gone through at least a beginner program, like your brain has been reprogrammed to to like these opportunities. You're exactly right. And just on that topic of being proactive is key. One of my biggest takeaways as an investor, if you want to be doing it right, is being, like you said, proactive rather than reactive. And a great example that I think people can think about is like, you know, you don't you don't wait 
till you do get into a car crash to then go, oh crap, I should have bought my insurance on the car. Or then mm-hmm. you're, you know, find yourself in that tricky situation. Rather than being reactive, the same way with our portfolio, we should be putting the steps in beforehand. Like you said, not almost, you, we should be anticipating this. And by by getting our insurance, let's call it beforehand, when these times do come, they, they shouldn't be scary. They should be more exciting. But again, you do have to be proactive on that. But that's, I love looking well, at it. That way. It's funny. When I was talking on point number one there, Brandon, I was thinking of the car insurance analogy mm-hmm. because everybody, you know, I don't like paying for insurance, but you do. You insure against catastrophic losses. And, and um, you know, sometimes because you have to if you want to drive a car, but even, you know, in your home or your apartment, you could have like property insurance or you could mm-hmm. have uh, content insurance, right? Everybody chooses whether you want to protect your your investments in that perspective. So, um, yeah, I look at it as an insurance. And I know, I mean, uh, I'm an older guy. I have a bond portion of my portfolio. In our portfolios, we have a bond portion. I know, Brandon, you have uh, a, a slice of bonds as well. And uh, certainly when you're younger, you could uh, have fewer bonds, have a, a smaller slice of bonds, but these are the times, and who knows, I mean, this could be the start of a 30, 40, 50% decline, um, or it could just be, we've seen the worst of it already, we don't know. Um, but because in the short term, it's so unknown, um, I have always uh, pushed, I've always talked about the importance of even younger investors with a long runway ahead of them to have some form of bonds, mostly because right now, if you're not experienced, there is a tendency to panic a little bit, get anxious. And mm-hmm. if you make a change, and we saw this two years ago now in March of 2020, when, I mean, I know there are there are investors who just pulled out of the market because they couldn't take it anymore. Um, and if they would have had a, a reasonably balanced portfolio, the hit wouldn't have been as bad. I think the markets were down 30% plus or whatever when, we, when COVID hit. And a, a properly developed portfolio should have been down maybe 15 at the most, probably yeah. 10, um, if if it's balanced properly, because things aren't going to um, always move at the same point on the portfolio construction. Um, it is interesting because we all love it. If you bought, say, 10 investments or 20 investments, we all love if they're going up at the same time. But if I ever sat down to look at a portfolio and over a period of time, everything was going up or everything was going down it's a total red flag that there isn't a balance there's not enough complementary uh, holdings in there so you never want you know I, I would sit down at the end of every year with my clients and look at okay of the 30 companies that we own what happened in 2019 2020 2021 and there was always a couple of outliers at the top a couple of outliers at the bottom and then most stuff was kind of somewhere in the middle and i i think that's um, a sign that the portfolio is constructed properly. Uh, and then when you have times like this, um, you know, they're not as scary. Uh, Moni says the pain of the gains I did not take and the feeling of what I should do are big. Um, great question. Jackie's saying, or Jackie or JC, I know we talked about your name before. Uh, I think it's Jack. I'm going to go. I think it's Jackie, but yeah, the, these, these are yeah. some funny, these are some funny comments. Sorry. I, I just want to take over because yeah, Jackie said, just yeah. write it. Don't sweat it. That's right. It's an opportunity to purchase. Absolutely. And I like what Moni said earlier. She said, it has been a great, painful experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a great, painful experience. And uh, Daniel, stick to the training and don't panic. Absolutely. And Mike says, yes, sir. I- yeah. And um, I, I, it is, it, it's, as I, I love what, um, what Michael said, I think there are Daniel said, just stick to the, the strategy and don't panic. And that is the, the the back part of the brain, I guess, thinking that, right? The front part of the brain or whichever side it is, like this that way, the front part of the brain is like fight or flight. And uh, so great strategy. And over time, when you go through these types of things, you will learn that more. Now, when it says stick uh, to the plan, we're assuming going in that the plan is a solid plan. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you were loaded up on growth stocks, and I did see some comments even this morning on the Discord about having like a, a, you know about a fifty percent drop in the growth portion of the portfolio. Now, in most cases, it should be a small chunk, um, but the, we know there's a lot of people who have o- far overweighted in growth, and so times like this can be very, very painful. Maybe uh, before, Beatrice says, "Yeah, oh, go ahead, Brandon." Sorry, no, I was going to say maybe before we move on to the next slide, we can quickly address. Mm-hmm. 
Moni's comment, and it is JC. It's JC, not Jackie. So JC is the name. But, oh, uh, JC, awesome. You know, maybe just very briefly, we can touch on. I've been thinking about putting on putting a stop once I get to fifteen percent of profits, because mm-hmm. it's such a common thought, and I'm I'm rather against that. I, I know you probably have a very similar train of thought, Dad, but um, yeah. So, Stop being like, let's say uh, you, you place a stop order, a stop loss, essentially saying if the market goes back down, I'll automatically sell my stocks. And that's mm-hmm. something that we don't use often uh, at all. We don't on a broad scale basis. And I, I think the question, I think that what you're saying there, Moni, is um, if you're at X today, you're, you want to put a stop in at 15% down from there. Um, yeah, I don't use stops a lot. And the main reason is... and stops can work in normal times but what we're seeing right now are volatile times and almost counterintuitively um, if we look at the day-to-day gyrations in the market it is so easy for a, a company to for your stock to get stopped out so it drops by pennies and these pros who play that market they they are placing orders and almost like these fishing orders that go in and they will see where all you know where that number is, and if a round number like fifteen is something probably pretty common, and so you're going to see them, the pros pushing, you know, waiting, and as soon as the price hits that, boom, they know everybody's getting stopped out. Then you're going to see, typically, quite often, a, a big pop in the stock. So, the danger that I find with stops, unless you're really, really on it all the time, is that you can get stopped out, and and next thing you know, you look. A week later and you don't own the company anymore and you just think oh wow it's had a nice nice pop here it's recovered nicely but you don't own it so be very careful with the stop it's not a panacea that okay you're going to guarantee that you're going to protect on the downside and there's I, the rarer uh, there's a rarer time as well with the stops where um there's a, in canada there's a there's a rule that says you can't just put a stop on and let's say the let's say you put a 10 percent stop and the stock opens 20% lower, that order will not be placed because there's a window um, that the regulators say, um, you know, well, they just put the rule on that say, if it opens below 10%, then the stop will just be wiped out. So we got to be careful in that respect. I like, what, I like what Zach said in summary, he said, I feel like a 15% stop or exit would defeat the purpose of long-term investing. And that to me is one of the key reasons why I don't do it. You know, I think of it more of a, as a trader tool somebody who's trying to play the shorts. Um, but absolutely, like I, 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 I'm so in line with that, Zach, that it, it, kind of, it kind of defeats the purpose of long-term investing. No, uh, I would put a caveat in there. I agree with that on a, on a broad scale basis. I do think though that for certain companies in certain environments, stops can, uh, can be good. But generally, so again, counterintuitively, not during the volatile times, it, it could lead to trouble. But on a, you know, you got a company that's, like a chip, you know, Procter and Gamble that just kind of, I mean, it, they go up and down obviously, but to a less degree. And if it's, let's say it's grown to a percentage of your portfolio that you're not comfortable going any higher. Well, then you can maybe place a stop on that, not expecting a huge swing, but when it does retrace, like we've seen recently in a number of companies, um, hey, you'll exit the position there. But again, you have to really be on top of those. So mm-hmm. yeah. But I'm, I'm going to go um, to the next. And I, so I, yeah, just, sorry, Ben, I'll just say uh, there isn't a, a blanket right or wrong with that, but you have to be aware of um, the, the the potentially unexpected or unintended consequences of the stops. I wouldn't say never use them. I wouldn't say use them as a broad thing. Mm-hmm. And I think just um, before we move on, Carson just yeah. gave some really nice feedback about the strategies he's learning and staying the course. That's right. You just stay the course and he loves what we teach. Thank you, Carson, for sharing. Um, maybe one do you want to answer this question, Dad, or do you want to continue on just in terms of time? But Annie says, nope. how about strategically selling some of my shares while the, while they're still high to open up some cash for buying the market dip? And it seems like Carson is thinking the same thing, um, essentially trimming trimming some of their winners to generate some cash. Well, and we go, you know, we're on slide two. That's fine. We can just leave it there, Darwin. But going back to slide one, yes, I'm a huge believer in this is just good old fashioned rebalancing where when you have these winners and we saw a lot of winners, I pulled about 15 slides off the other day on on charts of one year returns on so many companies that were up 100, 200, 300% at some point during 2021. 
and are now, you know, they've all fallen in the 50% range. Um, yeah, I, I believe that taking a profit, and, and so it's kind of another way of saying what you're, you know, strategically selling some while they're still high. Uh, I do that all the time. Um, you have to factor in taxes. You know, everybody's a little bit different, but knowing that about 20% of the time we're going to have these negative markets and every once in a while we have these these more sustained drops. Um, I think that is good old-fashioned um, portfolio management. And it is um, ideally if it can be done on an ongoing basis so that when this happens, um, you're not you know taking, you're not selling the stock that's 10% lower today. I mean, if it is, it is. Uh, but yeah, rebalancing, spreading that risk out, uh, awesome strategy in my opinion. You see, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people are are sort of talking about this strategy. Um, yeah, this is going back to the to the proactive nature of portfolio management. I, it it I guess it kind of um, disturbs me how it's so easy to fall off track when the markets are good, and you know we're going now through a cycle where we're seeing that. And one of the things that we try and sort of drill home at the academy here is that managing a portfolio is is an ongoing thing. It's not just when the markets are big or when the markets drop, you you dip, you buy the dips, which is an awesome strategy. But it it takes that regular review. Now, for some people, that can be every month. For some people, every quarter. Uh, typically, I do a good look at my portfolio every quarter, and and you know often there's no changes that need to be made, but I want to be sure of that. Um, but certainly at a minimum of every year, uh, people should be looking. And, you know, I would say if people started investing after the pandemic started, and so the middle of this p- past year would have been a really good time, you know, two years into that, uh, looking at what the, where their portfolios were and trimming some profits at that point. And to your point is then this is where you have some cash uh, available. The question of how much cash you should have in your portfolio will never be agreed upon. Um, I always like to have some cash. Partly it's because I'm you know, 59 years old. So I like that um, downside protection. A big part of it is because when times like this come along, uh, you want to have some money to invest in the market. There are some strong arguments that say, you know, well, we know the markets usually go up. So having any cash is, is ridiculous. Uh, I think it does add to, uh, it serves two purposes. It helps smooth the ride out. But also, it um, avoids or it gives you the the the, the fire power to, to buy in when the markets do dip. This so, um, yeah. Um, the next slide here, uh, just a uh, you know, looking at sort of the chat chat bar here, but um, just questions: Is this a surprise to anyone? And this this is a, a really serious question. It's not just a throwaway question, because hopefully, this is maybe it's the first time you've ever experienced this or maybe because of things you were reading you thought well this isn't going to happen right now but i would argue this should not be a surprise the fact that the markets have gone through this or are going through this correction shouldn't uh be a surprise um how are you feeling are you anxiety or you know are you licking your chops there i i again just going to the discord chats far more of our students are saying this is an opportunity to add now I would be careful with that too, because the markets have dropped. And I think back to when the pandemic hit um, back in uh, March of 2020, and the markets dropped about this much originally. And I know um, it was a, a buying opportunity, but the markets continued to drop another 20% below that. And so um, there is, you never know when that bottom is going to be until you know, you're know you well past it, because you can have that bounce and then it goes back down. Um, so buying or licking your chops or backing the truck up um, is something you have to be mindful of as well. Um, and you know, I think just strategically adding to some of the great companies, uh, typically I look for times like this where we see the dividend yield spike and if you can lock in those dividend yields. So just like you don't want to um, be extreme on one side, you don't want to be extreme on the other side either. And uh, always, uh, again, just have your game plan. And so even if you're looking your chops right now, uh, be careful with that. Uh, JC saying, uh, not at all. Carson, uh, you're answering everything and affirm what I see happening opportunities. That's awesome. And uh, Michael says, I, I found I was watching my portfolio too much. I trimmed the profit, but in doing so, I left a lot on the table. Yes. Uh, many times when you trim uh, a position, and uh, but I mean trim, I don't mean like selling out because 
uh, if it's a company that you want to own uh, for the long term, and it represents too big a part of your portfolio, absolutely trim that position. And you you would expect almost to leave something on the table. Um, it's not about getting every last dollar um, out of a, out of a company. And I did a video recently where I talked. You know, one of my biggest you know I would call it a mistake was back in the day when I was you know one of the earlier Amazon investors, and it got to a point. I mean, it made money, but it got to a point where it was just you know the valuations on it were were crazy. So I sold out of that and I left a lot of money on the table. However, um, it was part of my discipline and part of my strategy. And the money that you that you took out of that position, um, if you let's say you have a 75% uh, piece of the pie that you want in equity markets. Well, um, once you have, uh, let's say you take 5% out from whatever the company is, well, that frees up 5% to buy for something else. So it's not dead money. It shouldn't be dead money. If you take it out and just put it in cash, sure. But if you take it out and buy another company, like, you know, I'm thinking of Disney about, you know, back in March, Disney took a big drop uh, when the pandemic hit, of course. Um, and then I remember, you know, adding to that position and then it, you know, had a really nice recovery. Now it's pulled back again recently, like so many companies have, uh, but it's not like you just left the money there doing nothing. And so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's managing the portfolio. And just to sort of wrap up that point, the fact that you're taking profit on one company doesn't mean you're not doing anything with that money. You could just be buying another good solid company that may have gone down uh, during the time there. Um, Zach says, it seems like a correction has been talked about since last summer, uh, just a matter of when. Well, absolutely. And in fact, I, I got into the business in 1994. Um, and one of the things I learned very early on, there are always people talking about the market's ready to crash. Don't invest, just wait till we have the pullback. It seems to never go away. Um, even when the markets have done really well, that even emphasizes that, because you're gonna see in, heck, you know, we're on YouTube and I, I, I go and scroll, scroll through all the thumbnails. I mean, there's no, there's a, a never ending. For the last year, it has been, markets are gonna crash 90%, the market's gonna crash. And, and it's just like, if you keep saying it enough, like a broken clock, you're gonna be right twice a day, right? Um, and so, you will always hear talk about um, the markets going down. You will always hear talk about the markets going up. This is a time to buy. Uh, again, it doesn't, that stuff doesn't really matter to me. There's always going to be those extremes. We want to be somewhere in the middle of that um, where you have a basket uh, of companies that are going to serve you well. So Daniel says it's not a surprise because last year I feel the markets were high for too long for artificial reasons, printed money, COVID payouts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, for those of you who have kept up on our videos, I mean, I have felt for the last year, the markets are overvalued. And I mean that purely from a numbers. When you crunch the numbers, you look at the, the normal valuation metrics. You can't really argue that the markets have not been overvalued unless you're, uh, you know, fall into the, well, this time it's different cap. And I've been through that enough times that I don't think it's ever different. We always come back. It's always supply and demand. It's always consumer driven. I mean, you know, certain things that just are never going to change because we're humans. And so, um, you you will always you know hear those arguments. Uh, Michael says if I had checked only quarterly, it may have helped. Yeah, I, I think quarterly for most people, Michael, is a reasonable time frame. It's not onerous. It's not like you're there every day watching things. Um, things will happen within a three month time period, but generally speaking, not a whole bunch unless you just happen to have bad timing. You time it you know, the day before a correction starts or before a big pop in the market start. But uh, yeah, quarterly seems to be uh, a really good schedule. And in the profession, although uh, portfolio managers, advisors, you know, literally are watching the markets all the time, most uh, go through their, their uh, client portfolios on about a quarterly basis and look to see if there's any changes that should be made. Like I've said, there are quarters where I would work, look over my client's portfolios and go, nothing needs to be done. And there are quarters like that. That's that's a good thing. Uh, but you want to be on top of it. So and CJ says, would it be better to try and dollar cost average at times like this or invest as companies on the watch list that are down? Um, maybe a bit of both. Um, if you own companies, I think your, your point is, let's say I bought a company a month ago and now it's down. I love the company. I plan on owning it. Should I DCA into it? Uh, I would say, yeah. Uh, in one of our portfolios, um, Oh, with Adobe, we just we just made a trade on Adobe, because, and it's just a pure dollar cost averaging uh, move because we bought it, liked the valuation, 
it's got caught up in this draft that we have here. Um, so we just added to that as a dollar cost average or um, other companies that are on your watch list that are down. Yes, as long as it's not like, okay, I, I own 35 companies and I got 20 on my watch list and now I'm going to add them all. You still have to, you know, I always think you, you, you determine how big that slice of pie is going to be or how big that pizza is going to be. And then you work within that. Um, it's way too easy to just start adding names because you like where they're at, but it becomes pretty cumbersome. And often it becomes um, sort of over diversification. Um, I always try and think if I'm going to add something to the portfolio and I'm at my 75%, my 80% equities or my 100%, whatever you're at, um, what what would I take out? You know, what what would the, what is this a better investment today than something I already own? So uh, think about that there. Uh, Zach says that's very true. Uh, Annie, not a surprise, but realize I have a lot to learn about investing still. You know, Annie, um, I'll tell you a little quick story here. When Brandon started working with me, I had been an advisor for 20 years, uh, roughly. No, oh, longer than that. Gee, uh, but a long time. And when Brandon was taking his industry courses, um, I you know, went through a lot of that with him, just sort of a study buddy. And I was blown away how much things have changed in that time period. Um, and as a professional, you have to take continuing education. And there's a very legitimate reason that a lot of people hate the CE credits that you have to get but this industry is constantly evolving even things like you know the the cdrs that have come out recently or the the uh, fractional shares i mean these are things that if you don't keep up on you may be missing an opportunity you may not need them but but you may so yeah there's you never stop i guess my point is you never stop learning um, today it is january 28th 2022 um i'm still learning and i want to keep learning as long as i'm going to have uh, I'll probably be alive because I'll be an investor as, as long as I'm alive. Um, yeah, always keep learning. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, Darwin, if you don't mind going to the next slide there, we'll have a look. Um, okay, yeah, this is, um, you know, what do these corrections teach us? So let's just think about this for a moment because we know in our brains we are going to go through these. It's kind of, I, I mean, this might seem like a weird analogy, but I, you know, if any of you are in a relationship and you've been in a relationship for a long time, whether it's husband, wife, whether it's boyfriend, girlfriend, et cetera, whatever the, the combination is, um, most long-term relationships have gone through, I don't know, rough patches is the right word or challenges. There hasn't, nobody has had an entire relationship where you haven't had one day where you're kind of ticked off with each other. And those are normal parts of a relationship. And, and this relationship with money is much the same. When you have a bad day with your husband or a bad day with your wife, you know, you could think, oh, my God, like this relationship's, you know, going to fail here. And yet, if you are aware enough to think, no, you know what, we're two human beings. We spend a lot of time together. So we're just having a disagreement. It, too, will pass, much like we're doing, we're doing here. And so corrections like this are extremely valuable. It'll be interesting if we're talking here in two months, whether it was the correction that is now reversed, whether it was the start of a, a crash, because, you know, the, uh, the average crash is somewhere in the 35% range. Uh, so we're just, you know, touching the surface on that. But this is where you get a chance to really understand yourself as an investor. And, and point number three on the slide here, if you can see it, it says revisit your IPS. So your investment policy statement is something that um, is critical, in my opinion, to be a long-term investor. And it just means that you have to, you, you sit down and you literally put pen to paper or go on your phone and, and key it in, but you um, clarify to yourself what investing means to you, what the goals, the, what, you know, what money, what the, you know, the means to an end, as I like to say. So what is the purpose of investing for you? What type of an investor am I going to be? When times like this happen, um, how am I going to react? Um, it's not easy to un to know that until uh, you're going through time. So this is a perfect time right now uh, uh, to sit down and actually review your IPS and learn. And I, uh, there were certain clients I worked with who would swing a little bit more emotionally. You know, the markets are good, everything's happy, and the markets are turning, and, and people would be anxious. And, and I would um, ask them, almost demand, but I couldn't do that, but I'd ask them to keep a notebook and just say, Write down what you're feeling. Write down the actions that we've taken or not taken so that when this happens again in three years or in five years or in 10 years, 
you'll be able to look back and go, wow, yeah, this is something I, I remember going through this now, but you, we feel before we think, right? So um, that's, um, I, I think that's incredibly value. If, if you're the type of person who would have that discipline to do that um, and, you know, in, as a professional, um, I was, I, I had to keep copious notes. I had to, you know, when, when I would do my market reviews, I mean, I would make these notes and I would write out um, where, you know, I'm reducing the risk of the portfolio because of these reasons. And then you can look back on those and sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, but at least you understand the logic behind. Uh, Daniel has said here that personal training is the same thing that you have to continue your education. Um, yeah, uh, because I mean, hey, things change there too. Um, it's so funny how we always hear about you know health things and what is what is the recommended route of things to do, whether it's what we eat, the things that we do today, uh, gee, in 15 years, they're going to be different. And so it's always an evolving industry or evolving edu- um, component of our, of our well-being as well. And certainly our bodies are pretty darn important as well. So, And then the last point on here, well, I think point two, I kind of skipped over it, but I think I probably said it in other ways. Um, really learn from these times. Like really, this is so valuable, whether uh, whether we're, we're just starting this, this drop or whether we are uh, just, we've seen the worst of it already, really learn from these times. These are so educational. And you'll hear all of the old timers um, say that, you know, just go through these. And then number four, don't react without thinking. And what I kind of meant I, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, that's probably not as clear, but the fact that the markets have dipped, I touched on this a bit earlier, doesn't mean you run out and just start buying everything off your watch list. Um, you, you certainly don't, you know, exit positions that are good solid positions without thinking about it. Um, or you uh, you don't just go and buy willy nilly either. Uh, it's a point, it's a chance to sit down and really think about what you're doing. And you know what, I mean, I'll go so far as to say here, if you are an investor um, who has never been through a time like this, now you're going through it and you go like, wow, this is really smacking me in the face. And and I know intellectually that, that this is these are anxious times, but literally, you know, the proverbial, I, I can't sleep, like it's making me sick. Well, then maybe um, you have to assess who you are as an investor. Maybe you have to adjust your portfolio to accommodate who you are. But what you don't do is go, you know what, I can't do this, and then make changes. So you take some hits. You say, but you know, I can sleep at night now. And then in six months or a year when the markets are hot again, then you can't go like, okay, I'm comfortable now. I'll go back in. Really, really dig deep. Um, and that's what I mean about thinking. Think about who you are. Think about what works for you. Uh, really valuable uh, times for that. Uh, Beatrice says, um, that's the use for the investing notebook. We get hot. Yeah, for our investing feeling notes and journal. Uh, absolutely. Um, incredibly valuable. Sean says, um, would moving from single stock to ETFs during this volatility be a good idea? Um, generically, Sean, I would say probably not. Uh, two two things there. If, if you um, if you're talking, you, you said you referenced financials, and if you own the Canadian banks directly or you own a, a, a ETF that holds banks, they're going to be reacting very similarly right now. Um, I would say probably you wouldn't gain anything there. Now, if you have a very, very broadly based ETF versus the financials, uh, you would expect that those two act differently. Um, again, those are kind of the things that you would be positioned before you go in. Um, what what type of an investor am I going to be? What tools am I going to use? And um, a lot of investors use ETFs. They never touch individual securities. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. If that's your level of comfort, um, you will still have, I mean, ETFs are not um, all, all the same thing. So there are very focused, very volatile ETFs. There are very broad ETFs, but heck, even if you buy you know, the S&P 500, 504, 505 companies as of today, and you know, when I say the markets typically correct or crash, when they drop 35%, even 50%, like say, for example, back in well, 2008, most recently, um, that's the S&P 500 I'm talking about. That's not individual stocks. Some of them do much more than that, but these are even a broadly based ETF um, can, uh, can drop pretty considerably. And so, uh, yeah, um, you would assess your comfort level there, Sean, but I, I don't think as a strategy, 
uh, if I want to be a Canadian, uh, if I want to be invested in the Canadian banks and, and or financials or insurance companies, let's lump that in. And if I've already established that, if I've uh, taken out positions that will that will accomplish that goal for me, then I, I don't really see a huge benefit to doing it unless it's a psychological benefit and go like, OK, I have more diversification. But the banks are astoundingly similar in, you know, in how they go. There's always a little bit of difference because they run differently. But um, yeah, JC says you learn about who you are as an investor and your risk tolerance. Awesome point. Very critical. This this concept of risk tolerance is always with us. Um, I, when I worked with clients, especially when I started working with clients, I, I would almost play tricks. Like I would answer this. I would ask the same question in different ways to gauge the consistency of the answers. Um, and I think in most cases, people kind of understood what their tolerance was going in. And so I kind of did these checks, you know, over a series of meetings to make sure that it wasn't just, oh, the markets are good, so my risk tolerance is high. Um, I think that was my obligation to make sure I really understood my clients as much as possible. Um, same thing here. Um, I think that uh, that you but you know you learn what your tolerance is here uh and yeah these are times where you do you gut checks kind of kind of as simple as that and you know, these are the tougher gut checks i think a, a real gut check too is when the markets are hot and everything is done well and again i mean i think back to you know 6 months ago um the, the many of these growth stocks that that people were invested in it were substantially higher than they are today it's easier to ride those out. It's emotionally, it's fun. It's we're happy when our when our um, investments increase in value like that. But to be an investor, um, those times have to be acknowledged just as much as the more challenging times uh, we're feeling now. Uh, Carson says, "I'm feeling much better after listening to this. Um, I like ETFs, but I diversify. Solid dividend stocks. I love dividend stocks. I think an awesome solution is uh, some ETFs as a core." And then if you want to own individual securities, um, have some to uh, to sort of complement that strategy. Very, very good strategy in many cases. Um, Sean's just sort of going more detail. I currently own the three top financial banks and life codes. Um, your take on this was excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's kind of um, the way I feel about those or any sector. I mean, if you're in the energy sector or whatever, whatever you're in, I will take this as an opportunity also to just remind people not commenting on your portfolio here, Sean, because I don't know what else you own. But remember that Canada is about two and a half percent of the global um, market. So, you know, I, I think if you walked into Costco to go shopping, you wouldn't go just to the milk section or just to the sports section. You you want to go through the entire store as Canadians. And this is not exclusive to, to Canada. Um, globally, we have a you know, home country bias and people tend to invest in their own um, countries. That's just what you feel comfortable with and you know the names of the companies, but always make sure when, you're, um, when you are designing a portfolio that you, um, that you have a diversification in the equity component beyond Canada because there's, you know, the, the world's largest companies typically are outside of Canada, US for the most part, but uh, there are other companies around the world as well. So uh, please make sure that you, uh, this, we're talking here about portfolio management, and um, often when we see a correction like this, it's across all geographical uh, locations. But even having diversification uh, from a um, geographical perspective will help smooth out these bumps uh, as well. Uh, Darwin, if you don't mind, I think I have one more sort of a sort of a summary slide here. Oh, yeah, common questions that I heard from my clients. I just thought I would end uh, with this. But you hear, you know, clients say, okay, well, how long is this going to last? You know, when... When is this going to end? And um, the answer is we don't know yet, and we never know. Uh, we know it will end, um, but we just you know whether whether it is a a, a one month dip like we saw um, two years ago almost. That's very unusual. In fact, coming out of the COVID, the the, the retracement, the the gaining uh, coming out of the recovery from there was the shortest on record in the history. So that's unusual. Um, long, I think the average is somewhere in a range of like. I think it's 100, 200 days or somewhere in that range. So it's, 
it's unusual that we see a, a sharp drop and then a sharp recovery like we saw. Uh, so how long will it end? Well, you know what? Well, the answer to that question, and this is, this is a question I threw out there, uh, we'll know when it ends. And we will actually, more accurately, we'll know sometime after it's ended. I know that March 9th, 2009 was the bottom of the uh, financial crisis that we had, the credit crisis, but you didn't know it then. In fact, I've still got notes. I've still got, uh, literally, I recorded podcasts uh, from other uh, advisors where even as late as July and August, like, get out of the markets. This is just a fake bounce. It's a dead cat bounce. The worst is yet to come. Now, of course, we know that wasn't the case, but it takes a while, like, I don't know, a year or more before you really go, okay, we've seen the bottom of, of this drop. Um, question two here, should I change my strategy? Um, well, I would say assess your strategy. If um, if you are feeling one of the two extreme emotions, if you're feeling right now like I'm scared, uh, I can't sleep at night, um, let it sink in that what you're going through might be uh, anxiety you know, driven, um, but really assess, okay, going forward, because what's happened here as of today, we can't change anything that's happened previously, but this is where you do that assessment of yourself as an investor and um, uh, should, should, should you change your strategy? Uh, very rarely, I would, you know, there's an old saying, don't change horses in the middle of a stream. You kind of get through that stream and then you change the horse. Um, and uh, I think it's much the same here. But that said, um, as I kind of touched on earlier, if you truly are dying through this, then you might have to change your strategy. But it's a good time to assess the longer term strategy. Should I wait or should I sell and wait till things settle down? Um, yeah, um, generally the consensus there is no. Again, the assumption going in is that you have a properly positioned portfolio. Uh, kind of that's a baseline here. Um, very rarely does that work out. Um, there's you know this different stages of emotions that we go through when the markets are dropping and the bottom is you know called capitulation, where you just go, I give up, I can't do this anymore. Generally, when people do that, they uh, that's often a sign that the markets have bottomed out, and it, it's a really really hard thing to do, um, but. In the vast majority of cases, no, you shouldn't sell and wait till things settle down because as I just sort of touched on, you don't know when things have settled down. You can see a bottom, is it a false bottom? Is it you know, a little pop up? Um, so you don't know. And uh, I even saw some comments, I guess this morning uh, on our Discord channel where um, in the past, or I guess maybe it was on one of our YouTube channels where people have sold during these times and then it takes a lot of comfort to get back in. And if you're the type of person who this shakes you to the core, it's unlikely you're going to go, oh, things are good for a week, so I'm going to get back in. Um, usually, in, in fact, most of the time, um, you uh, you end up waiting on the sideline for too long and miss that recovery, which is obviously so critical. Uh, question four here, um, how far can things drop? Um, well, I mean, historically, like I say, in that 35% range is sort of average. Uh, the bigger drops, uh, the ones that I kind of remember mostly in my career, starting back with the tech crash sort of in the 50% range. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the I'm talking about the, um, the major equity uh, ind indices, such as like S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or the S&P uh, TSX, those indices that we tend to invest in. So yeah, half. Um, and so if you have an all, an all equity portfolio, I would say you should be prepared for a 50% drop. Hopefully it won't happen. And if you have a well-balanced portfolio, even a 50% drop, you should probably maybe take a 30% hit somewhere in that range. If you have some bonds mixed in there that will mitigate that drop, uh, the NASDAQ back in 2000, uh, 2001 dropped about like 80%. Um, and I would draw some comparisons there to, you know, what, let's just generically say the growth stocks now, the tech stocks, and we've seen, um, well, we're always seeing they will go up faster, they will go down faster. Um, do I predict that kind of a drop right now? Well, not necessarily, just because it's so rare. Could it happen? Yeah. But I always sort of like to go with the likely scenario. And I don't think it's likely that that's going to happen. That's just because they are quite rare, but they do come along. Uh, Michael says here, so the interest rate will be raised next month. Is this a part of the drop or uh, that's to come in March, perhaps? You know, great question. And I'm always, I've always been amused by, uh, you know, we know that, uh, let's just talk about the, the U.S. Fed because that's sort of the, the big market mover. We we know they telegraph ahead uh, roughly when they're expecting to raise rates or lower rates for that matter. And the market always reacts to that. And right now, 
Um, the the fact that in the last Fed meeting earlier this week, they um, you know they really projected that probably in March we're going to see this next raise, and so the weird thing about that is why would they raise the interest rates? They raise the interest rates because their data show that the markets are okay. You know, I kind of liken it to you know learning a one, teaching a one year old to walk, and you kind of hold their hands. And at some point you start letting go. Well, the interest rates are so low because the the, the federal the central banks have been supporting the economy, holding those little hands, right? And when they start to let go, generally that's a good thing. You think, oh wow, my kid's learning how to walk. I can I can ease back on this help. But the markets don't like that, and and understandably, I guess, um, because you know people do this short term calculations that say interest rates are X. So when you do the the calculations, the stock is valued at Y. Well. As soon as that interest rate goes up a quarter point, well, that changes the valuation. Uh, that said, I think it's very short term. I'm always amused, dismayed. Um, I struggle with how we know. And, and this, these, aren't, these aren't like your average mom and pa who are making these big trades. These are the institutions who are selling. So I, I, I'm always confused by why they do that. But yeah, good, good question, Michael. Um, so the interest rate will be raised next month. Is this part of the drop or... Um, or that's to come in March, perhaps. Uh, now, um, th- what we're seeing today definitely will at least be part in reaction to the anticipated income raise uh, because it happens every single time. So, yeah. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about uh, today, guys. And and um, I hope, uh, you know, I, I, I love the dialogue that we have with with the community here i love those who are participating um in the uh, in the discord and you know um i've talked to a few people over the past few days who um have said you know i, I kind of feel bad i i go into the discord but i don't really contribute that much uh, hey i'm sure there's a lot of people watching who ne- aren't necessarily uh you know keen on being a big contributor but that's perfectly fine that is there you know there's there's a, probably a smaller number of, well, there are a smaller number of the of the students who, you know, are more active. Perfectly fine. They're doing it because they want to. And if you're one of those people, we really thank you for that. But don't feel like you have to go in there and you know start analyzing things. If you go in and just look and learn, that's a really big uh, part of that whole uh, Discord channel. So, uh, Michael says thanks for keeping us calm and level. You're very welcome. Uh, Michael's 58. So all you young peeps, keep going. You will be shocked on your wealth at my age. Let's end on that, Michael. Um, the time value, it is stunning to me, as, you know, bordering on 60, how fast the last 40 years have gone by. Like just absolutely stunning. And when you look at a portfolio and you look at five years, a decade, two decades, and I was so blessed because I got to work with many of my clients for 20, 25 years and I saw the difference that decades will make. And you can't really get a grasp on that after one or two or three years. It, it is a it is a, a marathon, as they say. Um, and so, yeah, thanks, uh, Michael, for, for mentioning that because um, just like, you know, uh, for most of you who are 25, when you look in the mirror, when you're 55, you're going to look surprisingly different than you look today. Um, your portfolio will look surprisingly different than it does uh, today too. So, yeah, so thanks very much, everybody, for um, for joining. Um, I'm really, you know, just, uh, I like to say, I, I thought this would be uh, something that would be valuable to a lot of people um, to just chat about what we're going through and, and portfolio management. So um, I've got to log off here because uh, I've got another venture here at, at 10 o'clock, but uh, specific time here. So we'll end with that. Brandon, are you still on the call or are you gone there? Still there? I'm still, I'm still lurking around here. No, I'm just reading yeah. all the comments. Thank you, thank you guys all for tuning in. And yeah, thank really, you. really great. Love the thoughts today, Dad. I was uh, just, I was just listening in as well and just mm. absorbing because, uh, um, great choice of topic, and um, I think it is very relevant to what is going on today. So, and, and I don't even know in our in our academy there, Brandon, if you can bookmark these. I know we saved them, but this is the type mm-hmm. of thing that maybe in seven years you probably well probably talk about it again but maybe you go back and um and uh review this because these are timeless things i just talked about they're not related to what's we're going through now every single like i've been through these enough times exact same emotions exact same scenarios exact same learning curves so good exactly well yeah we are gonna sign thank up. you 
Yeah, sorry. For those of you who were on early when I was having my technical problems, thanks for bearing with me. I'm sure that Brandon and Darwin entertained you for those five minutes, whatever it was. But uh, we tried. Yeah. Okay, we, sounds we, good. We were poking. Uh, we were we were poking a little bit of fun at you for. Uh, I'm sure you were. I'm looking forward to hearing the replay so I can hear what, what was said. Cool. Well, hey, thank you guys all for tuning in. I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks, Darwin, for standing by. I know he's there in the background. And yeah, thank you for putting this together, Dad. Um, you bet. We will see you guys in the next live session. If not, see you guys all in the Discord. Thanks, everybody. Now, now see if I can learn how to log off here. <laughs> okay. See ya. See you guys. Bye-bye.